civil procedure. Civil procedure is the process by which a lawsuit makes its way through the legal system. It's not important that we spend a lot of time on civil procedure because it's highly technical. And honestly, it's really lawyers who need to know it if this isn't law school. However, we need to learn it a little bit for a couple of reasons. One is so that you, as you read these cases, because all of the cases you'll read in the textbook are actual real cases, it's hard to understand what happened if you don't know a little bit about that process by which the case made its way through the system. The second reason to study civil procedure is to see that this is a complicated and expensive process. And by expensive, I mean not just money, but also time, energy. When people sort of lightly say, oh, I'm going to sue, they don't really know what they're talking about. It's a big undertaking to sue someone. It's not something to be taken lightly. Let's talk a little bit about filing a lawsuit. The first phase of a lawsuit is called the pleadings. The pleadings are, what is each party saying? What is their stand? What is their allegation? The first pleading that gets filed is the complaint. The plaintiff, and that's the person suing, files a complaint. The complaint has to have at least two parts. There needs to be at least one cause of action. By ca cause is C-A-U-S-E, cause of action. There can be more than one, and there typically is more than one, but there must be at least one. What's a cause of action? A cause of action is an allegation, a theory, that if you prove it would permit you to win. This might sound strange, but think about it. A court is not going to let you file something saying he was a jerk and he should pay me money. You're out. Done. Instead, you need a legal theory under which that other person does owe you money. So that's what we're going to spend most of our time talking about. What are those legal theories, those causes of action? A simple one, well, actually not a simple one, but a common one is negligence. We'll be studying this more later. But basically, negligence is saying he or she failed to exercise reasonable care, resulting in his rear-ending my car, causing me damages, and therefore he owes me money. So the cause of action in that example would be negligence. The second part of any complaint is the prayer. I know this is funny language, but it means, what do you want? You're praying for the court to do something. What is it? Basically, it's what remedy are you asking for from this court? And again, if you go to a court and say, oh, he did all these bad things, he was negligent, fix it, you'll get kicked out of court. Because you have to say, what is it you're asking this court to do? So, there are these two parts, the cause of action and the prayer that make up a complaint. In response to that, and this is true from the very beginning, someone who is being sued, the defendant, can either answer or they can try to get the complaint dismissed. That's a fancy way of saying get the lawsuit thrown out of court. Will it be successful? Who knows? If it's a question of law, for example, that the plaintiff hasn't pled an adequate complaint, it will get thrown out right then. And I just want to warn you, all along the way, there are a lot of different ways and kinds of possibilities for a lawsuit to get kicked out of court. And these have different names. I have them listed on the PowerPoint. And bold demurs, motions for summary judgment, directed verdicts, motions NOV. And it's not important that you know the differences among these. What is important is that you know that those are other names for trying to get a case dismissed. They have different names depending on when they occur during the litigation, but we don't care much about that for this class. If the defendant doesn't initially try to get the lawsuit thrown out of court, she'll file an answer. What's an answer? Typically, it is a denial. For example, I didn't do anything wrong, and even if I had, they didn't suffer any harm. So, court, please find in my favor. Sometimes, in addition to an answer, you will find a defendant 
who not only denies that it's his fault, but says it's someone else's fault. It's not my fault that I rear-ended your car, but if it's anyone's fault, it's the fault of the car repairman because the day before the accident, I took my car in to have the brakes worked on, so, so it's his fault. And that pleading would be called a cross-complaint or, in some courts, a counterclaim. It might also be that the defendant files a cross-complaint against the plaintiff, for example, saying, not only is this not my fault, but it's your fault, and therefore I'm suing you. Now, all of this mess gets heard at one time. In other words, you're not going to have separate trials for the complaint and all the cross-complaints. It's one event, and it's far more efficient and consistent to have the whole thing heard at once. So that's what's going to happen. Along the way, after the trial level, the second stage of the lawsuit is the discovery stage. You're allowed to discover what evidence the other party has against you. The third and final phase of any lawsuit is the trial, but you rarely get that far. Because this process of working through the complaints, the pleadings, the discovery, most lawsuits settle during that period because there are a lot of costs attached to this whole process. And by costs, again, I don't mean just money, although certainly money is involved. There's also emotional expenditure, and there's also opportunity cost. What else could you be doing with your time and money instead of spending it on this lawsuit? There's another expense that's a little more subtle, and that is uncertainty. If you talk to any litigant, they'll say, well, I'll win because I'm right. It's hard as an attorney or as a businessman to say to somebody, you may or may not win. It's up to 12 people who got jury duty that week. Instead, parties want vindication. The more you can get a person past that need for vindication, the smarter the business decision they'll make. If an attorney tells you that there's a 100% chance that you will be successful, my advice is find another attorney. There's not a 100% chance of anything. Far more useful as a business person is to ask the attorney, what are the chances? What are the odds? What are the chances I'll be successful? And if I am successful, how much am I likely to be awarded? Or how much will likely be awarded against me? So if I were representing a defendant, I would say something like, well, based on my analysis, there's a 25% chance that you'll be found liable. And if so, the damages would come in at the $100,000 range. Okay, that gives a business person some numbers to work with about risk and reward, and that's helpful. So think about it more in that way. This is not a crusade for truth and justice. I wish it were, but it's not. It is instead a way to solve complaints. And in solving complaints, be smart. As a business person, be smart. Figure your odds and be strategic. So, of these fewer than 5% of cases that go to trial, and you've seen trials before because you've seen them probably on movies and TV, you know there's a plaintiff and at least one defendant, and there's often a jury, but not always, and there's always a judge. Of those cases that actually get tried, and many cases will instead settle, and by settle I mean they the parties decide not to go to trial someone decides to pay someone else or make some other decision and the case goes away. Many cases settle immediately before the trial or during the trial, either because things that have come out that don't look so good or the parties start to get cold feet or something happens. They're not sure about the jurors. We all work on deadline and that's one deadline that tends to instigate a lot of settlements. However, if you are of that small minority of cases that actually went to trial and had a verdict, then what's the next thing that might happen? You might go to appeal. If one of the parties, the plaintiff, the defendant, the cross-complainant, the cross-defendant, if they're not happy with the result, it's possible for them to file an appeal. That would typically go to the Court of Appeal. Whether you're talking about state court or a federal court, you'd go to a court of appeal. 
You've probably never seen a court of appeal in a dramatization like on TV or in a movie. And the reason why is because it's not dramatic. They're not seeing the witnesses, there's no jury, there's nothing dramatic happening. And it won't be a single judge, it will be an uneven number of justices. A typical court of appeal would have three justices. The reason for an uneven number of justices is to have a tiebreaker so that if two justices think one thing and the third thinks another way, it's two against one, that's your result. And it's possible that you can appeal from the Court of Appeal to a Supreme Court. Every state, in addition to the federal government, has a Supreme Court, and you've probably heard of results at that level. Those Supreme Courts typically have nine justices. And if you followed the news at all, you'll often see that they often disagree and have split results. Please realize that every case in your textbook went to, at least to a court of appeal. So these are unusual cases that you have in your textbook because they were of that small minority of cases that not only got dismissed before trial or went to trial, but they also went to appeal. Less than 1% of all cases go to trial, go to appeal, and get published and reported. By reported, I mean they're published by the courts, and you can normally cite them as precedent. All of the cases in the textbook have been published. That tells us that they're interesting for some reason. The reason they're interesting is because there was some real dispute about what the law means. And that's why they're in your book, and that's why we're analyzing them. What was that dispute about?